Hi everybody, welcome back to Bible in a Year. My name is Natalie and today we are on day 252. I'm so happy that you're here today and I hope that your day is going fantastic. We are going to be reading out of 2 Samuel chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, but only verses 1 through 21. And then we're going to close out the day with two chapters in Psalm, Psalm 122 and uh, Psalm 123. So let's get started with 2 Samuel chapter 14. Now Joab, the son of uh, Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. Joab sent to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there and said to her, Please act like a mourner and put on mourning clothing, please, and don't anoint yourself with oil, but be as a woman who has mourned a long time for the dead. Go in to the king and speak like this to him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground, showed respect, and said, Help, O king. The king said to her, What ails you? And she answered, Truly, I am a widow, and my husband is dead. Your servant had two sons, and they both fought together in the field, and there was no one to part them. But the one struck the other and killed him. Behold, the whole family has risen against your servant, and they say, Deliver him who struck his brother, that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he killed, and so destroy the heir also. Thus they would quench my coal which is left, and would leave to my husband neither name nor remainder on the surface of the earth. The king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give a command concerning you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, O king, may the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and may the king and his throne be guiltless. And the king said, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me, and he will not bother you any more. And then she said, Please let the king remember, Yahweh your God, that the avenger of blood destroy not any more, uh, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As Yahweh lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the earth. Then the woman said, Please let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. And he said, Say on. The woman said, Why then have you devised such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking this word, the king is as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring home again his banished one. For we must die, and are like water spilled on the ground, which can't be gathered up again. Neither does God take away life, but devises means, that he who is banished not be an outcast from him. Now therefore, seeing that I have come to speak this word to my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. Your servant said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his servant. For the king will hear to deliver his servant out of the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God. Then your servant said, Please let the word of my lord the king bring rest. For as an angel of God, so is my lord the king to discern good and bad. May Yahweh your God be with you. Then the king answered the woman, Please don't hide anything from me that I ask you. The woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. The king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? And the woman answered, As your soul lives, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. For your servant Joab urged me, and he put all these words in my mouth, in the mouth of your servant. Your servant Joab has done this thing to change the face of the matter. 
My Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God to know all things that are in the earth. The king said to Joab, Behold now, I have granted this thing. Go therefore and bring the young man Absalom back. Joab fell to the ground on his face, showed respect, and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, in, in that the king has performed the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. The king said, Let him return to his own house, but let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and didn't see the king's face. Now in all Israel there was no one to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no defect in him. When he cut, his ha when he cut the hair of his head, now it was at every year's end that he cut it, because it was heavy on him, therefore he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head at two hundred shekels after the king's weight. Three sons were born to Absalom and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a woman with a beautiful face, and Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem, and he didn't see the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. Then he sent again a second time, but he would not come to him. Therefore he said to his servants, Behold, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom to his house and said to him, Why have your servants set uh, my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent to you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king, to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. Now therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there is iniquity in me, let him kill me. So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Hmm. Well, we'll find out what happens tomorrow on that one. All right. Ezekiel chapter 8. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, the Lord Yahweh's hand fell on me there. And then I saw, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward, fire, and from his waist and upward, as the appearance of brightness, as it were glowing metal. He stretched out the form of a, of a hand and took me by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and the sky and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the gate of the inner court that looks toward the north, where there was um, the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the appearance that I saw in the plain. And then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north and saw northward of the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commit here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But you will again see yet other great abominations. He brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, 
Son of man, dig now in the wall. When I had dug in the wall, I saw a door, and he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they have done here. So I went in and looked and saw every form of creeping things, abominable animals, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed around on the wall. Seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel stood before them. In the middle of them, Jazaniah, the son of Saphan, stood, every man with his, center, with his censer in his hand, and the smell of the cloud of incense went up. And then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in his rooms of imagery. For they say, Yahweh doesn't see us. Yahweh has forsaken the land. He said also to me, You will again see more of the great abomination which they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north, and I saw the woman sit there weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? You will again see yet greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house, and I saw at the door of Yahweh's temple, between the porch and the altar, there were about twenty-five men with their backs towards Yahweh's temple and their faces toward the east. They were worshiping the sun toward the east. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have turned again to provoke me to anger. Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I will also deal in wrath. My eye won't spare, neither will I have pity." Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Oh, that is so sad. And again, just as a reminder, um, it, you know, I am not bringing down, I'm not bringing God down to a human level. But in our humanness, when we are... Um, ignored, when we are verbally abused, when we are not given respect, do you want to hang around those people? I, I certainly don't, and I have. I have walked away from many people that treat me poorly. And um, so with that, I do not, I do not blame God and his wrath as a fault. So many people, they say, how, how could a God of love, you know, have so much anger and wrath? Well, let's read about it. Let's read in the, in the Old Testament. Let's read about everything that man has done against God. And then maybe that'll bring a little clarification where the wrath comes in. <laughs> okay, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. Here we go. In those days, when there was a very great multitude, and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have stayed with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away fasting to their home, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come a very long way. His disciples answered him, From where could one satisfy these people with bread, here in a deserted place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves. 
having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to serve, and they served the multitude. They also had a few small fish. Having blessed them, he said to serve these also. They ate and were filled. They took up seven baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Those who had eaten were about 4,000. And then he sent them away. Immediately he entered into the boat with his disciples and came into the region of Dalmanthua. The Pharisees came out and began to question him, seeking from him a sign from heaven and testing him. He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Most certainly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. He left them and again entering into the boat, departed to the other side. They forgot to take bread and they didn't have more than one loaf in the boat with them. He warned them, saying, Take heed. And beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They reasoned with one another, saying, It's because we have no bread. And Jesus, perceiving it, said to them, Why do you reason that it's because you have no bread? Don't you perceive yet or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they told him, 12. When the, uh, when the seven loaves fed the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they told him, seven. He asked them, don't you understand yet? <laughs> Don't you get it? <laughs> oh, Jesus, he cracks me up. All right, Psalm 122. It's not what I wanted here. Hold on one second. Sorry, 122 and 123. So what happened is my format, you know, after I do a reading, I prepare for tomorrow, and the format actually skipped Psalm 123. I thought, well, wait a minute. What do we do about that? So we're just going to read them both today. And um, somebody just wasn't paying attention, like me. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is another Song of Ascents by David. I was glad when they said to me, Let's go to Yahweh's house. Our feet are standing within the gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Where the tribes go up, even Yah's tribes, according to an ordinance from Israel, to give thanks to Yahweh's name. For there are set thrones for judgment, the thrones of David's house. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those who love you will prosper. Peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For my brothers and companions' sakes, I will now say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our God, I will seek your good. Psalm 123. This is another song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to you, you who sit in the heavens. And behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to Yahweh our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Yahweh. Have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scoffing of those who are at ease, with the, con uh, with the contempt of the proud. Have mercy on us. 
And I'll tell you, there, what I'm noticing in the religious circles is there's not a lot of uh, discussions anymore. The conversations that are happening are, this is right, you are wrong. Or they're saying, this is right, and you are wrong. And all I hear in the uh, discussions, the only thing I hear is, you are wrong. And for that, I cry out, please have mercy on us. Because there is nothing wrong with loving God and loving people. And that is what we were asked to do. If we love God, I mean truly love God. It's not, oh, I love God like I love chocolate. If we truly love God, we are not going to be angry towards one another. I dare say we are not going to be judgmental towards one another because our eyes and our hearts are going to be trained on God and we are going to be loving Him and nothing else matters. And then what was the second? To love people. If we truly follow that commandment and love people, I mean love them, not love them like you love chocolate. <laughs> you, you love them with your heart and your spirit. And then you're also loving God at the same time. You are not going to want to wish harm upon them. It is not going to matter to you if they bring harm upon you. It's just not going to matter. That is what Christianity is supposed to be. Christianity is supposed to be love. It's all about love. And everything else, if we can grasp on to those two concepts, to truly love God and truly love people, everything else will fall into place. God will have vengeance on people that hurt us. God will take care of situations that we might disagree with. God will handle it. It is not our job. And so with that, I agree. Have mercy on us. Please have mercy on us. So that's it for today. They are really um, making these days short. And what makes me a little nervous about it is that usually means that there's going to be <laughs> Some long days ahead. So uh, we're just going to enjoy these um, short meetings. Thank you for coming by today. Um, think about the words that we read. Remember Jesus' compassion, his softness, his fluidity, and the way he moved through um, toxic situations and challenging questions. And just how he responds with love and kindness and um, some humor. <laughs> he, was, he was pretty funny. Um, so anyway, come on back for tomorrow, which will be day 253. Have the most wonderful day today, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.